We have a subject this morning uh, that I really think we should give attention to because it is not only arising in private lives, but is showing a tremendous influence in public affairs. Actually, the individual seems to be strongly divided between what might be termed an internal and an external code. The inner life of the average person is not consistent in many instances with his claims, his pretensions, and his affirmations. Very often, people come to seek help in various ways, and most of them have been betrayed by their own inner subjective lives. There seems to be a kind of purgatory inside of us. One of the old Rosicrucian writers pointed out that the three worlds in which man functions are all also within his own body. And uh, if he has heaven, earth, and perdition within himself, it is obvious that it will manifest through his conduct. Now, the problem that we have with the underworld of man's inner life is the tremendous intensity behind it, an intensity that is seldom questioned or censored by the conscious mind. There are pressures against which the average person does not seem to have any defenses. These pressures may perhaps be considered as karmic, we are born into this world with a lot of unfinished business. And in most cases, uh, we are here to pay debts, to um, correct mistakes, to outgrow restrictions and limitations of character. But in many instances, the mistakes are not corrected. We continue to live with them. We continue to be dominated and influenced by them. And until we are able to control the inner part of our own lives, the outer part will not function very smoothly. We will have troubles all the way along. An example of this, for instance, we can find in the educational world. The average person is considerably influenced by education. If he has received an unusually complete education, he is supposed to end as a civilized human being. But this does not seem to be guaranteed. Instead of being civilized, he is simply better trained in how to use his own selfishness and how to advance his own causes at the expense of common good. His education has not made him a basically honorable person. It has made him skillful, but not good. It has made him educated, but not wise. And it has left him open to most of the misfortunes of the flesh through which he will gradually pass. Now, how does it happen that 10 or 15 years of schooling do not actually change the internal integration of the person. How does it happen that we can advance so many secondary causes in our careers, but not touch the basic cause of our own existence? Also, I think we have to take into consideration uh, that most persons, regardless of their various attainments are governed by certain atavistic pressures that have come down to them from the remote past. The flesh has within itself its own limitations. It has its own peculiar pressures. The body has demands uh, that are completely separate from the demands of the mind and heart. The heart has demands which are not consistent with those of the body. And the mind, in its own tyranny, seeks to dominate both. This conflict within us 
is responsible for much of the sorrow in the world around us. Let us take another pertinent example of the situation, and that is religion. Nearly every nation of the earth has at one time or another received a valid religious message. It has been given a code, a creed, a doctrine to help the people to grow and unfold their own spiritual, moral, ethical potentials. Yet with probably 70 or 75 percent of the world nominally addicted to religious beliefs that are founded in the brotherhood of man, we still have one war after another. Religion does not seem to be able to control the internal selfishness of the individual. Religions have not yet even been able to make peace with each other. And a great many religions have never been able to make peace with the branches of themselves. Here is a valid doctrine based upon natural law and divine revelation, and most persons will admit that they accept it, but very few are able to put it to work in daily life. Out of the abuses of religion, there has come a general revolution producing a series of agnostic or atheistic societies. These societies insist that religion is merely an instrument used by the establishment to enslave the human mind. So they have discarded it, and they put something else in its place. And with this new thing they put in its place, they continue to enslave the human mind. There's no basic change in principles. There are new names, new political allegiances, new explanations and new justifications. But the old tyrannies go on. Now we have in the scientific world every justification for the development of a great ethical moral code. The materialistic scientist has little or no justification for his own materialism. He is constantly in the presence of wonders that should bring him to his knees in adoration of the infinite. He learns all these things without being touched by the mysterious wonder of the fields of his own researches. He is not able to actually see through his own formulas to the great principles upon which these formulas depend. And these great principles are all spiritual mysteries. So we have the scientist in the midst of the evidence of an eternal providence doubting everything. We also have in the forms of government, there is no nation that has not received some revelation, either out of religion or philosophy, as to the proper methods of government. Most government would accept these requisites. Most governments claim justice, claim to protect and serve. Most leaders admit that they are the servants of their own peoples. But in substance and essence, these truths are not actually believed. They are held, they are accepted, they are preached, but they are not practiced. So everywhere we see an, a world of great needs, a world with deep and real problems. And we have all kinds of texts, religious, philosophical, scientific, ethical, political, social, even industrial, pointing out the principles that should be observed, but they are not. And the fact that they should be and that they are commonly accepted, this fact does not seem to reach into the individual deeply enough to change his basic relationships with his fellow men. Thus, we have to look inside to see why we have been able to have a Christian world for 19 centuries and yet have not been able 
to make Christianity the solid foundation of our mutual relationships. How it happens that we do acknowledge a religious value in life. Our cities and communities abound in churches. Many of them are very gracious and beautiful beliefs. And not a few of them are strongly supported, not only by the average parishioner, but by persons of wealth and influence. And yet these churches have not been able to prevent small towns and communities in which they stand from being locked in the most dangerous and detrimental feudalistic attitudes. How does it come that what has been generally accepted as the most civilizing force that man has ever received, how we have had this for thousands of years and for the most part have succeeded in remaining uncivilized? This goes back to the person. The answer has to lie within the individual himself. And it has to lie within enough individuals so that the ends and purposes of progress have been frustrated. Now, we know that we live it now, especially now, in a time uh, when the private citizen is not especially qualified uh, to make major changes in social problems. We have certain influence. We have the power of the vote. There are things we can do. But the great problems that confront us seemingly are beyond uh, the control of the average person. He can only endure. He can only hope. And he can only give as allegiance as far as possible to those principles which he regards as best. And he's not always very successful in doing this. You go and uh, work with some of these people as individuals, and you find that many of them have studied deeply. Many of them have given a lifetime uh, to esoteric matters. Some have become proficient in astrology. Others have gone into other phases of research, into alchemy, and into all kinds of oriental philosophies and religions. They have devoted a long period of time to the study of natural laws, as these are exemplified in the great spiritual teachings of humanity. Yet with a lifetime of such background work, with the ability to quote great authorities, with a definite allegiance to these authorities, most of the persons thus equipped are unable to handle their own affairs. They are not capable, apparently, of taking what they honestly believe and using it as it should be used. The question is why? The answer is the tremendous imposition of self-interest. As Buddha pointed out, 25 centuries ago, the individual who is primarily concerned with himself is lost from the beginning, and no amount of education can help him until he gets over his own self-centeredness. Self-centeredness seems to cause the individual to cheerfully uh, contradict his own ethics if it seems that it will produce some personal advantage for himself. Now, wherever compromise of this kind exists, its folly is based in the area in which the compromise occurs. Nearly all compromise is for the purpose of improving immediate material situations. In other words, compromise is the compromising of spiritual truth to advance material ambitions. The individual is sacrificing that which is the most valuable part of himself uh, for the proverbial bowl of pottage. He is willing to hazard not only his present embodiment, but his health, his happiness, his home, and overshadow future embodiments with bad karma simply because 
he is interested in one primary circumstance, the immediate advancement of his own purposes. This is true of nations. Nations are struggling to advance their own selfish purposes. Groups of thinkers are more concerned in trying to maintain their status as intellectuals than they are in being honest. Politicians, while they would love to be persons of high character, are afraid to stand for principles for fear they will not be reelected. And practically every educator is afraid to tell the truth for fear he will destroy his own scholastic standing. So he keeps his standing, but he falls as far as his principles are concerned. Therefore, the inside of each one of us has something in it that is as old as time, and that is the craving to do what it wants to do at all cost. This has become such a familiar uh, part of our natures that we don't even define it anymore. We don't keep saying to ourselves, I'm catering to the worst part of my own disposition. We take it for granted that to do what we please is the primary purpose for existence. We don't defend it anymore. We couldn't. We don't try to understand it for fear that we will discover we are wrong. Therefore, we simply take it for granted that whatever impulses arise in ourselves for the advantage of our own condition immediately, these impulses are inevitable, eternal, and divinely inspired. Having taken all this for granted, we simply act over the surface of our own convictions without giving them any valid foundation. One of the most common indications of this situation is our inability to handle the golden rule. Now, there are very few people who will deny that the golden rule is important, and it has been built into the religious philosophy of practically every one of the world's religions. But the golden rule, while it can be quoted and is quoted frequently, requires an attitude toward conduct which is generally missing. We do not do unto others as we would have them do unto us. We do unto others what we please and hope we do it so fast they can't retaliate. <laughs> also, we find that we have within ourselves a concept of love. The human heart is the holy grail of early Christian mysticism. Within it flows forever the blood of the Savior, life itself. Most persons have polished the outside of the cup rather thoroughly, but very few have examined the inside of their own emotional, spiritual attitudes. They have not cleansed the inside of their own cup, their own heart. They have used their heart to gratify whatever impulse or attitude they may happen to have. We also have in a wonderful built-in mechanism by which we convince ourselves that our own mistakes are unique and noble. We have been able to excuse and condone practically any attitude that we wish. And we always manage to do it in some way that makes us look righteous to ourselves, but not to anyone else. So we find so often that the real problem that we all face is the inability to orient ourselves in a proper definition of universal life. Now, the mystics have done probably the best of most of those who have tried. They have sought to find an internal experience of God. And wherever this experience has been legitimately found, it has been accompanied by humility, 
self-sacrifice, voluntary poverty, and the gradual reluctance to take part in any of the destructive patterns of human conduct. The mystic has tried to make the eternal superior to the temporal. He has thought in terms of his eternal existence rather than in the three score years and ten we hear about here. The mystic is the only one who has recognized a universal citizenship and has realized that the laws of the universe take precedence over any of the laws or articles which have been compiled by mankind for external purposes. The moment the laws of a nation depart from the laws of nature, that nation is in trouble, and we're in desperate trouble now. The moment the laws of integrity fail within the individual, he is in trouble, and he is in deep trouble. And, of course, the way the universe operates, there is a definite relationship between the misfortunes of society in general and the causes which have been set up by individuals within that social structure. The type of world we live in is the kind we have earned. And because we have not earned peace, we do not have it. Because we have not been thoughtful of others, they are not thoughtful of us. Because we have placed certain schemes and strategies ahead of principles and integrities, we are the victims of our own schemes and strategies, and will remain so as long as we continue in our present course. It's also very valuable to realize that our citizenship in this world is comparatively brief. This does not mean that we may not make a an encore at a little later date. But it does mean that at the moment we are few of years and have many troubles. In the face of the fact that our material existence is in hazard and that there can be no reasonable doubt that we are responsible for that hazard, it would seem that in the few brief years that the individual has that he would try to make peace with the universal plan of which he is a part. That he would gradually come to realize that he is not primarily under the allegiance of man-made statutes. He is ultimately and inevitably in servitude to a universal process, a pattern that is immutable and inevitable. To sacrifice a little of the so-called passing comforts of this world in order to assure oneself of being on the side of that which must ultimately be victorious. It would seem that in a moment of this type we would begin to give serious thought to the correction of our own internal uh, arrogance or misunderstanding. Now, it's, uh, for most people, it's a rather simple thing, and it isn't so spectacular, but people come to me all the time with their problems. They proceed to explain why they cannot get along with their relatives, or why they are worried to death because one of their children is planning to marry into another religion. Sometimes these people cannot orient themselves at all because of the grievances they have brought forward from the past. Individuals who claim to be emancipated from all personality will spend hundreds of hours giving the most detailed explanation of their own misfortunes. They never get over a grievance, and they seemingly have very little skill in remembering the countless good things that have happened to them. Grievances take precedence. The individual who has suffered a little has very little time left to think about the wonderful things that have happened or to realize that many wonderful things have been spoiled by his own attitudes. So he comes and seeks consolation of spirit while at the same time clinging to every prejudice that he has, determined that his own way will be supreme, 
he condemns all the candidates for public office, has trouble with all his acquaintances, cannot get along with his children or their children, and sets, settled, uh, settles down to the point of plain suffering. Not over the problems that are real, but the problems he has created for himself. You tell this person that this is not a very good religious attitude, and after listening to these stories for hours and pointing this out to him, he will smile at you pathetically and say the one thing, of course, I don't hold any grudges. My problems are real, and I have been more than patient with them. I have put up with them for years and suffered for them every moment. And he's, well, that person is grateful that in their own heart they love everybody. In fact, they do love almost everybody they've never met or heard of. <laughs> now, how does this happen? How can people go through an experience like this and see nothing? How can they forget what they're actually saying while they're telling it to you? How can they break the middle of a complaint to say that they never complain? <laughs> the answer has to be one thing. This something inside of them has become so inevitable, so irrevocable and so unchangeable that it is no longer even considered as a factor in anything. It is an inevitable. The individual with a difficult disposition regards this as an eternal endowment for which he cannot be blamed, which forces him to do things that he does not want to do, but he has no power not to do those things. This brings us then to the underworld problem in our own natures, for somewhere lurking inside of ourselves is this blind spot, which simply cannot permit us uh, to work together, think together, live together, or love each other in a decent manner. Why, why do we have this? I've watched it and listened to it and thought about it. And it seems to me that in all probabilities, most people are born with dispositions. Being born with them, they have never known the absence of them. They have taken it for granted that their disposition is themselves, and this is not true. They have taken it for granted that their likes and dislikes arise from a divine source within themselves and are unchangeable. That if their attitudes are difficult, other people must adjust. They are incapable of modifying their own points of view. And to tell them that the point of view is wrong is simply to insult them. They will not face the fact that this thing inside of themselves which is causing this point of view is something that can be changed, that can be modified, that it can be controlled. But in order to control it, the individual has to make certain changes in himself. One thing he has to do if he wants to control this pressure is to get over the idea or the experience that holding these negative attitudes adds to his own peace of mind or comfort. If he continues to believe that a bad disposition is the fulfillment of himself, he will continue to nurse it. As long as he is able to gain some kind of satisfaction from being difficult, he will have very little incentive to change his ways. If he finds, for instance, that through a dispositional peculiarity, he is able to revenge himself for slights or avenge some unpleasant circumstance to which he has been the victim. If he finds in it a glorification, I told you so, and prove conclusively that some unpleasant thought was justified. If in some way or another these personal attitudes 
help to build his own stature in his own eyes, if they make him feel bigger, if they make him feel victorious, he will seldom decide to go against them, even though the victory that he is gaining may only be the beginning of another defeat. He just uh, will do everything he can to defend himself. This is because his own mind is a kind of prejudiced lawyer that is going to desperately defend him even when the lawyer himself knows that the culprit is wrong. This um, ca must cause someone or many people, especially now when the worldwide situation is so obvious, to think a minute about what these principles and problems really relate to. I think Buddhism made a very good statement of the whole thing. And it borrowed it, of course, from Hinduism. And that is the line of the Bhagavad Gita. The mind is the slayer of the real. Our problem lies in that neat little package that we call the think tank. It belongs to the mental integration. The mind is not always right. The mind is usually wrong if it is allowed to dominate. If you say to the mind, do what you want, you will have a tyrant on your hands. If you say to yourself, I will defend the mind right or wrong, the tyrant will grow stronger. The mind which tells us to dislike each other is, in a sense of the word, uh, an evil spirit. It is the adversary. It is the devil's advocate. The mind that justifies our being unreasonable or tries to tell us that we can be unpleasant because others are unpleasant is leading us astray because there is no possible way in which a bad disposition can be justified because of the number of people who have one. It only means that there is a larger number to be miserable. And this dispositional problem remains to the end, something that stands between us and happiness. I've actually seen a bad disposition functioning on the deathbed. And among the last words of the, of the dying person was something malicious. They never get over it. In fact, they like to assume that they're going to leave behind them something else to cause a little unhappiness to others. And when you try to find out why, you learn that other people have made them unhappy. So it must be passed on as a heritage to burden humanity for the rest of its existence. If we can get away from the idea that the mind is infallible. And also, if we can get away from the pressure which the mind immediately sets up. Before the other person has finished a sentence, our mind has worked up a way of refuting it. We can hardly wait to tell the other person he's wrong. Sometimes we can't wait. It can be very embarrassing on occasions, too. But if we could gradually re re recognize this problem, we could uh, maybe do something about it. But to still the mind, to be able to do what it says in the scriptures, be still and know that I am God. If we can stop the mind from its multitudinous little conspiracies, if we can... Uh, no longer allow it to be a yes man to our own personal desires. We can do other things and do them well. In the Orient, the answer has always been the same. Quiet the mind down. Gradually detach the mind from personal advantage. Tell the mind for once and for all that we are not primarily concerned in doing what we want to do at the moment. This is an interruption and an interference. That what we really want to do is what is best for us for all time. 
we are not really interested in winning an argument. What we are really interested in is living an example of integrity. Now, sometimes it takes a lot of work to get the mind to believe that. And one of the reasons it doesn't believe it is because we have failed so often to live up to a good idea. We have made a resolution and broken it before we've finished telling the name of it. It's like New Year's resolutions. Very few of them last until Washington's birthday. The uh, individual has broken down his own defense mechanism so often that he is no longer even sure that he can keep his own promise or that he can do what he was supposed to do in the first place. The only way in which you can get the mind away from these problems is either to channel it into other directions or else learn to quiet it down. Learn to discipline it and realize that the that we no, do not use it anymore. It means that we stop abusing it or permitting it to abuse us. We have to realize that the mind is not the divine power within our own natures. The mind in us is not the God in us. The mind in us, for most persons, is an antichrist. It is working against the very purposes for which a good life should be dedicated. By slowing down the mind a little bit, or by facing it with different experiences, we gain certain help. Because the mind is capable of doing quite a lot of thinking if you give it a chance. And once you can convince the mind that it is wrong in something, it will very often go along with you. I know a number of cases in which individuals had very serious intolerances relating to religion. Uh, they were simply completely unable uh, to accept the validity of any faith except their own. These same persons were for the most part racially intolerant because races have their religions. And if you don't like the religion, you don't like the race and vice versa. Some of these people who were very adamant and very provincial in their attitudes, for one reason or another, moved into a foreign country. Many of them went in business capacities to the Far East. Some of them went to the African states. Others went to other parts of the world where different religious beliefs exist. It was a great experience for these people to suddenly find that they were strangers. That instead of being in control of the situation, they were isolated individuals, rather picturesque to the natives, who viewed them with the same wonder that they had been viewing the natives in turn. After a while, however, many of these people began to respect the beliefs that they had formerly completely rejected. They found that in these other countries there were sincere people, that they had beautiful thoughts, that they were raising their children well, that they had reasonable governments, that they had good educational systems, a great love of art and music and literature and all kinds of pleasant things. And many times these prejudices were very definitely corrected. But this was by direct exposure to a fact. If they had not gone there of themselves, they would never have accepted. This also carries with it the possibility of changing the minds by exploring and investigating those areas in which you hold prejudice. There's a very cute story of an old English theologian who loved to write sermons and give them with great passion against astrology. Well, of course, in that day, as in now, uh, the astrologers were a kind of minority group that were not flourishing too well. 
But finally, he ran out of information. He couldn't figure out anything more to say to deride the subject. So it occurred to him that the only possible answer was to make a few acquaintances among the astrologers themselves so that he could find out new weapons against them. So he went and cultivated several astrologers for a short time and then came back and never started to discuss the subject again. He admitted that the more he knew about it, the more he realized his own uh, prejudices and opinions. So often by mingling with something against which you have a prejudice, you will make an important discovery. But only if you will use every possible internal resource to prevent the prejudice from anticipating the changes and leaving you without a clear mind to do your own thinking. Another possibility of this type of thing is simply to reduce uh, the areas of Un uh, unfair prejudices through a little philosophy. Now, philosophy has a place in religion. Some people think it's a separate subject, but it really isn't. Philosophy is a kind of way of bringing yourself into harmony with facts or helping you to understand or evaluate the situations that arise in your personal thinking. So a little philosophy can be very valuable, and it can help you to recover from this feeling of the immense urgency of having your own way. Philosophy can begin to tell you that most of the situations in which you are unpleasant or unkind have very little substance in themselves. You are very anxious to get ahead. You are going to sacrifice friendship, family, integrity, and everything in terms of wealth. And about that time, you read in the paper about the individual who got his first million and the next day had a coronary. Thinking this over, you can do a little philosophizing. Are the things you are reaching for worth the danger that they bring into your own life? Now, one of the common things that brings danger into our own lives is not necessarily an inveterate ambition. It is in an inveterate irritability. Many people simply born in the objective case. They never are able to agree with anything. They find fault with everything. They criticize and condemn whether they know anything about the subject or not. And of course, always feel that they are well informed simply because that is the way they feel about it. Now, if a person goes through life constantly belittling others, or constantly trying to press some advantage to themselves, or to sitting in judgment on other human beings. Or to sitting in judgment on other human beings. Gradually, uh, these attitudes react. The person who is too critical loses his friends. The individual who is intolerant has a broken family on his hands. And one by one, the good things of life are killed out or suppressed by this constant nagging or this constant fault-finding. What does this do to the health? Practically all of the classicals of health, and many of the modern, especially since the rise of some schools of idealistic psychology, almost any physician, any psychiatrist or psychologist will tell you that a bad disposition is the heaviest burden that flesh must bear. The individual with the greatest chance of having a happy and healthy life is the one who is by nature kindly, generous, and optimistic. This doesn't mean that the kindly person cannot suffer occasionally or will not have moments of difficulty. But it does mean that if the grand pattern of life is friendly, health will be better. There is less likelihood of high blood pressure. The functions of digestion will not be so interfered with. Hatred, suspicion, condemnation are toxic, and they are more dangerous than any microbe that we could possibly run against. 
everything that destroys peace of mind threatens survival. And so too many people have uh, suffered from lack of this type of personal integration, which overcomes this type of problem. Now, you will find, and I realize that the mind might bring this up as a strong defense, that you will find people of very advanced years who have nasty dispositions. It's not necessarily limited to the young, nor does the disposition always cause the person who has it to drop dead. What it does do, however, usually is make the individual who has it wish he could drop dead an attitude which may be shared by his associates. <laughs> to live along without some form of internal peace is simply to prolong the process of dying. The individual dies the moment he cannot face life cheerfully. And the uh, dispositional factor is too dangerous to be endured in these times. We all need peace of soul. We all need quietude within ourselves. We need a unity of our own resources, that this uh, inner part of our own lives will not betray us and will not keep us in a constant state of agitation and annoyance. Actually, uh, the oriental discipline of Zen has been a great help to many people, although it's perfectly possible to practice this type of thought with any religion. In fact, every religion is basically founded upon it, because every religion is founded upon the dignity of peace. And wherever peace is violated, the true spirit of faith is lost. So to try to work out these problems, you have to, to a measure at least, reduce the temptation to annoyance. Now, I've talked to people about this, and they say frequently that they'd love to do that if the other person would stop annoying them. It always moves to the other person. But no one person can be annoyed uh, completely by themselves. There's an old Zo uh, Zen uh, con about that, and uh, in which it says something about the, dis the master telling the disciple, now clap your hands together. The young man did so. After a few moments, the old master says, now clap one hand. And the youth didn't know what to do about it. But the two people involved in an annoyance cannot function if one of them is not annoyed. And if you can't change other people, and you can't usually, you are the one who had best not be annoyed. And you can escape annoyance in many ways. First, you can escape it on the grounds of its triviality. A little thinking and the annoyance may not be worth anything. Another way of escaping it is to consider that an interruption may not be a difficulty unless you permit it to be one. Another way of avoiding annoyance is trying to understand the other person and what they are going through. Instead of assuming that you are a very nervous, sensitive individual being abused by someone else, maybe you should think about them being the sensitive, nervous individual under great strength, who does not have the strength of character to control themselves. If such is the case, then your strength of character should control you. Little by little, you can philosophize yourself out of a great many of these situations. But, of course, there's always this pile up in the background that all of the philosophizing is simply ways of trying to convince you not to do the things that you should not do. And the, in, and the implication may not be strong enough. It is always there, this strange pressure within all of us the pressure that goes back perhaps to the beginning of our human existence or goes back far into the dawn of the forces which brought forth the humanity that we know today. 
that every part of the being, seemingly, is under the pressure of self-will. And as the Zohar says, because of self-will, so fell the angels. Self-will is the will to do what you want. And some way it must be brought into harmony with the divine will, which wills that you should do what is necessary. Necessity is the final guide. And necessity tells us that only through integrity can we survive. If you have some of these little problems that are annoying you, you can start in by settling quietly down somewhere once in a while and try to think through one of these problems. Why do you have these antagonisms against people? What have these people done for, to you that caused it? Sometimes the antagonism is simply due to an editorial you read in the newspaper. Sometimes you have been convinced by the com commentators that there is some group uh, that uh, you are justified in disliking. You always have the right to censor your associations. If there's something you do not believe in, you do not have to say that it is right. Nor do you have to follow a certain Pollyannish Pollyannish idea of trying to see good where it isn't. This is not required. The thing that is required is that if you cannot support it, leave it alone. If you do not understand it, put it to one side until you do. Do not agree with anything that is wrong. But do not allow yourself to become emotionally involved in prejudice, criticism, and condemnation. It is one thing to quietly say this, I cannot accept. I cannot accept it because, and then give yourself a good reason. This is perfectly right. But when you dramatize it, get yourself all worked up over it. Try your best to force other people to jo join you in the attitude. And also, when it comes to exact discussion, find you cannot support your own position, then it is best to relax and save your energy. I heard quite an argument not too long ago about two very opinionated people. And uh, it, it reached the shouting standpoint. Of course, uh, in our culture, you don't go beyond shouting uh, unless you have strong political feelings. But... Um, <laughs> In this case, the argument suddenly stopped in the moment, in the middle of something, and one said to the other, prove it. Where did you get this idea? Where does it come from? Prove it. The other person couldn't prove it. They were two hours of argument far away from proof. It might have started with a small bit of evidence, but by the time the question came along, the evidence was forgotten. It was pressure, force, the inevitable belief that if someone makes a statement, we must object. So when you are in problems with some of these problems, prove them to yourself. Before you dislike someone, sit down and make sure you have some kind of proof and that this proof justifies your attitude and why this proof would prevent you from finally understanding this other person and seeing if you cannot remedy the, the error that exists. For in many instances, it's your own prejudice only that is causing the, the fault. All these little tricks you can use on yourself to try to lower this tremendous determination to do exactly as you please. It is uh, almost always proof that whatever you believe is not as strong as your attitude. A religion is not an attitude. Religion is not a creed. You can join any religion in the world and accept its creed and do nothing about it. A religion is a way of life in harmony with divine principles. What a person claims religiously may mean nothing. Nominal membership in a religious organization 
which says salvation is to be attained only by joining that group, has very little substance to it. It might help somebody for a moment, but it is one of those things that has to be ultimately outgrown. The actual practice of religion is the practice of the presence of God in conduct all the time. It is the realization that every thought that we have is either enlightened or benighted. And that if it is neither enlightened nor benighted, it probably isn't much value and can be forgotten. This attitude of religion is to be determined solely by the fact that religion binds up wounds. When it creates them, it is no longer religion regardless of what it is called. We have had thousands of years of religious wars. We are threatened with more. We find individuals believing in the brotherhood of humanity can't get along with their neighbors. All of these people claim some kind of religion or ethics or morality or integrity, but they cannot demonstrate it in daily conduct. And uh, any, any religion which enables us to keep right on disliking everything we disliked before criticizing everyone we criticized before, and continuing the pressured efforts to achieve our own selfish ends, while these things are present, whatever religion we believe is shortchanged badly. It's a matter of putting it to work. Now, putting it to work is not as difficult as it might seem to be. And I've known a number of instances in which putting it to work solved the problem. It's very important to a prejudice that it never confronts a fact. The moment the fact moves in, the prejudice is in trouble. A prejudice is not really a basic fault that we have discovered in something. It is an attitude that we have toward something. Now, if another person or situations are so morally or ethically delinquent that we cannot accept them or cannot reconcile them, then the only answer that we have in most cases is to leave the solution to the law. The power of heaven will take care of it. The Chinese knew this long ago. Leave the impersonal, the, leave the impossible person to heaven. Karma, the law, will solve it. Great day by day, that impersonal, that impossible person will find it more and more difficult to maintain their own wrong attitudes. We cannot change other people. We can try. Sometimes we can help a little. But if a situation is too deeply ingrained, the law must do it. We live in a universe in which law is ultimately benevolent in every form. There is no selfishness, there is no willfulness, there is no prejudice in universal law. The purpose of these mysterious processes of nature are that happiness, security, integrity, and perfection shall come to all that lives, and it will come. If we can help a little, that is good. But if we cannot help, there's no sense in hindering. So where we do have an opportunity, we can study to find out how we can smooth out our own intemperances or intolerances and prejudices and bigotries and find a way of life that is not only useful to us but the final sermon for the final sermon is example we cannot expect children uh, to profit from parental advice unless the parents are keeping that advice themselves we cannot expect to be respected by our associates if we do not keep the principles we claim. We cannot help people in trouble unless we have demonstrated simply and clearly that we have passed through such troubles and have come through with a better and deeper insight. The end of all difficulty is to strengthen insight, to give us greater foundations, greater securities, 
uh, greater bases for personal integrity. We can, therefore, set a good example. And if we are able to follow the golden rule, if we are able to follow the Sermon on the Mount, or its equivalent in other religions, we can then be at peace with those who would despitefully use us. We can return good for evil. But most people just can't quite get around to that. When they are hurt, they want to hurt someone else. When they feel they're unjustly treated, they must turn around and do an unjust deed in retaliation. This is not right. If you are mistreated, then the problem is to settle down quietly and find out what the facts are. It might be a common mistake. It might be something that has no foundation in depth, whatever. But whatever it is, find out how you can face it with justice, but also with complete mercy. The quality of mercy is not strength. And in all things, justice and mercy go together. We can judge other people, but if we judge them without mercy, we are simply endangering our own blood pressure. It is very important for us to try to justify the, mis the minor mistakes of other people. When you find someone as a little unpleasant or a little uh, uncertain in disposition at a certain moment, try to instantly and inevitably wonder what problem they are facing. Instead of taking the attitude that they're unpleasant, try to understand how perhaps you could do something to help them. Try always to keep a constructive point of view. If you can do this, you will gradually recondition your own ambitions. The greatest and important trans uh, fusion of of good feeling that we have is a marvelous ability uh, to transform ambition into as as to aspiration. Ambition is the personality struggling for its dignities. Aspiration is the soul seeking truth. And this search for reality is finally the great journey of life. It's nice to have an adventurous career. We are none of us too fond of monotony. It is wonderful to have something to look forward to, something to build toward, something that will give us deeper satisfaction than we have ever known before. And in all cases, this is tied to aspiration. Aspiration is the impulse to become better, to become more like truth to allow more of truth to move through ourselves. Aspiration is a continuous unfolding of becoming. It has nothing to do with the gradual accumulation of possession. It does not follow that aspiration must be poverty-stricken, but aspiration must be so dedicated that whatever it possesses is properly used. Ambition does not guide usage. Ambition does not protect the individual from the misuse of his own success. Aspiration does. Aspiration makes it possible for the individual to succeed harmlessly. For it does not make any difference in this world how much truth or insight we are able to gather. No one else is deprived of anything. No one else is cheated. And by our nature, we will never use constructive insight to exploit or endanger any other living creature. Aspiration protects us from selfishness. It protects us from the tyranny of ambition. It protects us from egotism. And it also opens the way to the final reconciliation of all religion. It makes it possible for the individual to see in all faiths paths leading to the final objective, which is the transmutation of the inner life. It is assumed that that which becomes like truth will participate in truth. 
that which becomes like soul will become soul, and that which become, uh, is like the God will ultimately become one with God. Anything that leads away from these basic achievements is not good. Now, we cannot expect anyone to change completely all at once. It will take time to gain some of these insights that we need. But the beginning is to convince ourselves that we need to change, that there are processes going, in, going on inside of ourselves that are not worthy of us, that we are allowing ourselves to fall victim uh, to an inferior part of our own composite constitution and that this inferior part is centered in self-will, selfishness, arrogance, ambition, and greed. But all of these are unreasonable. As Buddha points out, these together are the causes of suffering. While they continue, there can be no end to suffering. The individual who is greedy never has enough. The individual who is ambitious sacrifices too much and still never fulfills his own ambitions. He may reach the high point that he wants, but he can only keep it a few years when another will take it from him. As one of the emperors of Rome, fearing that his successor uh, would come along, tried to destroy everyone who might possibly succeed him. But finally, an old sage told him very gently, he said, Your Majesty, no man in the history of the world has ever succeeded in destroying his own successor. There will always be someone. In the same way, there is no amount of success that will enable us to prevent someone else from ultimately taking over the things that we have. The real answer is not in this accumulation or the building up of reputation or name. The real answer is the unfoldment of those values within ourselves, which in the end, naturally, result in a reputation that will never die. Because the greatest reputations in the world are those associated with the great teachers and benefactors of mankind. Jesus had no worldly goods and no place to lay his head. But all of the rulers of the earth at one time or another have bowed down to him. Buddha had sacrificed an, an empire, a country, gave up all his worldly goods to become a wandering mendicant. And as a result of that, he has become the most beloved person in Asia. Confucius was not practically penniless. He didn't have very much but he lived a rather useful life. His last words were, I have failed. Instead of that, he has become perhaps the symbol of the highest attainment of the Chinese consciousness. All these are not part of the passing reputation. They are part of the inevitable consequence of gaining divine merit. Merit in itself is the final source of all reputation, all honor, and all acceptance. And it may well be that the meritorious person will not live to see the result of conduct. It may be that the wise and thoughtful parent may not live to see the effect of its wisdom, insight, and love upon a receptive child. But that good goes on, not only to the child, but to that child's child, on and on through time. All good builds, all evil destroys itself. Almost everyone who has attempted to break the rules has finally discovered that the way that the life goes after rules are broken, that no man has really broken them. Each, in turn, is broken by the rules he sought to break. And in all these different procedures of living, uh, the individual who keeps the rules is kept by them and goes on to fulfill the real purpose of himself. 
Materialism has limited our viewpoint on some of these things. Many people feel the only thing to do is to live while you're alive and get all there is all along the line. But it is a very temporary and impermanent state of affairs. And as we go along now, trying to live according to our present economy, which strangely enough is not very economical, we uh, find every day things get a little worse. The more selfish we are, the more we all suffer. The more we grab, the more pain comes to us. Uh, the more we resent truth, the more our errors hurt. And this goes on and on. So every person can do a little something about it. Every individual can take a look inside of himself and try to clean the inside of his own cup. He can try to make sure that everything that flows out of him is basically good and constructive. And to remember always that it is far better to be cheated than it is to cheat someone else. Wisdom can prevent you from being cheated. But wisdom is the only answer when the time comes when you feel like cheating someone else. Then if your wisdom is great enough, you can withstand the temptation. Everywhere along the way, we, we can make little steps in the right direction. We can kind of cultivate things where we've had blank spots. Perhaps we haven't liked certain people or certain types of people. Or we've looked down upon certain religions or faiths. Well, perhaps if we attended a few services of these other religions, we would understand them better. Wherever there is a tendency uh, to dislike, make certain that you really understand what the matter is about. Very often, our dislikes are built on very inadequate grounds. They are on very bad logic. This idea that we are dislike dogs because all dogs are like the one that bit us. And this is a false attitude. There are some very fine dogs, and they may be the same breed as the dog that bit us. But it's also possible that we did something to excite that dog to bite us. If we didn't, then we have a right to say that dog was dangerous. But this does not mean that we shall declare all dogs to be dangerous. A member of some minority group cheats us. And because this one person has cheated us, all that group is condemned together. We don't like the attitudes of certain religious groups. But we do not realize that these attitudes while they are supposedly common, may be quite unique. For in most cases, believe it or not, other religions are made up of people very much like ourselves. And all the various faults that we find in some faiths are not as any deeper or more insistent than the faults in our own, which we have overlooked for ages. So everywhere work for reconciliation. And you will find that in this reconciliation, you will have fewer headaches and many fewer heartaches. You will have much better relationships with life. And you will have freedom from all of this wasted time and energy. Actually, mental pressure has as one very definite aspect, nervous tension. The individual gets nervous and excited and irritated and shy, starts shouting and screaming about something when they're just nervous. And this nervousness is often associated with some small unpleasantness that isn't worth being nervous about. The individual, I've had many of them tell me uh, that they do not know why they got nervous about it. But they just couldn't help it at the time. They were a little tired things hadn't been going very well, then this small occurrence came along and it was just too much. If we quiet down our own inner lives, these kind of emergencies never happen at all. The most natural and easy way to complete any job is in a sense to allow it to complete itself. 
If we will just be quiet and let things move according to their own natures, we will save a tremendous amount of tension. Because the moment we get out of the way of a problem, that problem may solve better than when we stand between it and solution. So in every case where possible, where problems get a little tense or stressed, just quiet down. Pick up a book, read a couple of inspirational pages, turn on a little good music. If you turn on the wrong music, your nervousness will go into a further depression. But uh, pick up a little music, look at a beautiful painting, take a walk in the countryside, do something to restore your contact with life, and recognize that we are all living in a wonderful universe that we are doing our best to spoil. And each individual lives in his own little universe, which he is doing his best to spoil. And the spoilage is becoming general. And we simply can't afford it. It is unreal, un, uh, spiritual, and cruel. So when the next time you have an idea that you've got to go out and gossip about someone, or you've got to tell for their own good somebody else all is false, or something of this kind, just quiet down and look inside and see if you can find the machinery and the wheels turning in there that make it so easy for you to follow that procedure. Find out, if you can, how you can transform the function within yourself so that it begins to cherish good, begins to look for good. It won't always find it, but in many cases it can find good where previously it has found tension and stress. Here there is a certain value in constructive thinking. But constructive thinking too often is concerned merely with the gratification of some personal desire. We want something. So constructive thinking is to tell ourselves that we're entitled to it. Well, maybe it helps. It certainly does if the individual has a serious inferiority complex. But constructive thinking is not merely a form of self-gratification. Constructive thinking is the realization of the divine power in life. It's the realization that truth rules all things. It is the realization that justice is inevitable. And it is also realization that the greatest instrument for the achievement of the good we search for is to learn quietly, gently, and lovingly to love one another, to do those things which are kind and helpful, if we can sell ourselves this inside, we will find that our outer lives will be much more constructive, useful, and happy. And as we approach a symbol of resurrection in the Easter Sunday that is to come, let us see if we can't restore something of the divine purpose in ourselves so that into this cup of our hearts can flow the blood of salvation, that we can become instruments for the dissemination of reality rather than to permit ourselves to be nagging little creatures. We have simply not claimed our birthright because we were born to do good. And as soon as we really realize that and start living accordingly, there will be a lot more good in this world. Well, I guess that's all there is. But, uh, I'd like, to, I'd like to make a special announcement at this time. On Good Friday, April 4th, at 9.30 a.m., the library is going to present one of my taped lectures. It's be a, they were going to play a tape that was made some time ago on the subject of Zen and the harassed housewife. Now, that has, it seems to me, a kind of message it ought to be good for a major symposium of some kind. <laughs> on seven, at 7.30 p.m. on Good Friday, there will be a, uh, a showing here of two films. One on Petra, the, the, the red city of Petra, and the other on Ceylon. These two films will emphasize religious and philosophical elements. So you are invited to these two special activities on Good Friday. Thank you very much.